Ever since we've been able to communicate using speech, we've been able to hear our own voice reproduced in the natural world through echoes, Hello? sound waves that travel to and bounce back from hard reflective surfaces like Hello? these rock faces. But being able to capture and store these waves is a surprisingly recent invention. Thomas Edison started it all with his invention of the phonograph in 1877. Mary had a little lamb, it screeched with quite a snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb would sure to go. If we could travel back in time, imagine how difficult it would be to explain to somebody from the late 19th century what sound recording was. We could have said it's like the sound equivalent of how the camera, invented just a couple of decades earlier, can store an image. Or we could have said it's a bit like a mechanical parrot that will squawk back exactly what we say to it at the touch of a button. Mary had a little lamb, it screeched with quite a snow. When Thomas Edison first publicly displayed his phonograph, it was to huge acclaim and it instantly made him world famous. Interestingly, Edison hadn't foreseen that one of the principal applications of his invention would be for the reproduction of music. If only Thomas Edison could have seen what his creation actually developed into. Here at the Grammy Museum in Los Angeles, they've assembled exhibits and artifacts that trace the history of recording all the way from the tin foil cylinder right through to the iPod. The rotating cylinder on the phonograph developed into the flat disc on Emil Berliner's gramophone that was patented in 1887. In 1900, Valdemar Poulsen of Denmark patented the first magnetic recorder called the telegraphone using steel wire. But it was a long time, some four decades, before the basic principle was adapted into machines using magnetic tape. Soon after the turn of the 19th century, flat discs had largely superseded Edison's rather short-lived cylinder technology. Mass production techniques for cellulose and shellac records made the hand-wound gramophone a common household object. The development of electrical recording spawned the concept of the sound recording studio and recorded music, as an art form, burst into life. Celebrated British composer Sir Edward Elgar recorded with the London Symphony Orchestra at the grand opening of Abbey Road Studios in November of 1931. For movies to contain sound, audio was recorded optically by a photographic process onto the edge of 35mm film, adjacent to the picture. Incredibly, the soundtrack for Walt Disney's Fantasia, made in 1939, was recorded stereophonically on eight such optical tracks. The Ampex company started making magnetic tape recorders in the 1940s. Tape, in countless incarnations and variations, became the standard recording and playback medium from the 1950s through to the turn of the century. The technology of magnetic tape opened up sound recording to a whole new generation of artists and along with them, a new breed of professional technicians, engineers and producers. But as the Grammy people will tell you, it's not just the technology, it's what you do with that technology that counts. And one can't really live without the other. The Beatles had a big influence on the way that recording technology developed. When they recorded Please Please Me, the whole album, amazingly, was recorded in a day. And as George Harrison famously quoted, the second album took even longer. In those days, they recorded on two-track, quarter-inch tape, to make an overdub, or a superimposition, as Abbey Road called it, they would copy one tape to another while adding the new material. The rhythm track, or instruments, would usually be on track one, and the vocals on track two. These two tracks were then mixed down to mono for the final master. 
Somewhat hilariously, the two-track tape was also released as a so-called stereo version, where the backing track was on the left and the vocals were on the right. Right up to Sgt. Pepper, stereo was just an afterthought, but Pepper was a big turning point. Four-track had arrived by then, along with the ability to overdub new material onto the same tape and remain in sync, a previously impossible feat. The complexity of the album involved huge engineering challenges, and Jeff Emmerich was the recipient of a well-deserved Grammy for his work as engineer of the album. It's still hard to believe that it was recorded on four-track. By the time I'd started at Abbey Road, we were recording the Beatles on eight-track. Then came 16-track, the format we used to record Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. Then 24-track. Will it ever end, we asked. The answer was no, it probably wouldn't, because before long, Digital technology came along and allowed us to have an unlimited number of tracks at our disposal. Almost all of the great engineers and producers whose work is celebrated here spent years learning their craft at places like Capitol Records here in Los Angeles, Record Plant in New York, and Abbey Road Studios in London. Unfortunately, only a handful of large commercial recording studios exist today which makes it very difficult for a young engineer to get the experience that I had, recording an orchestra one day, a pop band the next, an opera singer the next, and so on. One viewing of this program is not going to turn you into Quincy Jones or George Martin, but what we hope it will do is help teach you the most important ability an engineer and producer should have, and that's how to listen. That covers judging sound quality, sound balance, learning when something is lacking, and learning when enough is enough. Too many producers tend to be over-producers. The Recording Academy's full name is the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences. That name was naturally enough an influence for the title of this programme. The Recording Academy has always embraced and acknowledged the countless composers and artists that form our musical heritage, but it also acknowledges the producers, the engineers and the technologists, without whom modern recording would not be the same. This program peeks behind the curtain and unveils the tools and techniques that music lovers don't normally get to see. Our main objective was to make a how-to video encyclopedia for those interested in the technical side of recording. Although you'll see plenty of knob twiddling and parameter adjusting, sound recording is not just a modus operandi and hard and fast rules. It's about developing an understanding and a feel for both the artistic as well as the technical. The art and science of sound recording is more than just a static presentation where I show you things and you listen. It's also more than just a reflection of my own personal opinions. I've tried to resist telling you what to do so much as showing and suggesting a range of approaches you might want to consider. And to keep it even more real, I've spent a good part of the two years it's taken to make this programme interviewing many celebrated engineers, producers and artists about their experiences as well. The Grammys and the Grammy Museum itself are causes for celebration in the art of music making. And so is this programme. We look at everything from how sound is generated, how it reacts acoustically in a professional studio or your garage, to how sounds can be manipulated using EQ and other forms of processing. We also look at how the tools of sound recording are used in practice. Recording a drummer, a bass player, a singer, or groups of people, from a high school choir to LA's top session guys on a live rock tracking session. Of course, the greatest technological stride in recent years for everyone has been the internet. The concept of reality has been stood on its head. In one section of the programme, you'll see an internet recording session, where the performer is thousands of miles away from the producer. Our own website is an important partner in the programme as a whole. The site contains uncompressed audio demonstrations and examples, and it's also a place where registered viewers can get up-to-date bonus materials, discuss sound recording on the forums, ask me questions in monthly webcasts, and even mix tracks. In a relatively short space of time, we've gone from this to this. All that remains now is to look at the tools, tasks, and techniques of sound recording in detail. Onward! <laughs>